Welcome to The Jess Larson Show, where I interview innovators and leaders. Today on the show, we've got Renee Duaback, founder of Renee. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a little bit of this story ahead of time. Before we talk about uh, the name, um, why don't you tell people what the service does, the app, the humans, all, sure, all the sure things. Thing. Yeah, all the things. So Renee, named for me, uh, is a personal health assistant. So imagine that you are a caregiver for a loved one and she takes three medications. Renee will ensure that her medications are delivered on time. She doesn't run out. She remembers to take them with any instructions. Imagine that the same person that has those three medications has an appointment coming up. Renee will remind to go to the appointment, help with the ride, get the notes after the appointment, make sure everything's carried out based on that doctor's care plan. Renee handles all the tasks in between the time where you don't see the doctor, right? Every time you see a doctor, that doctor gives you a list of things to do. In those three months, you got to get them done. Renee helps. Renee does all of that back end work. Last time you were on the show, you, you hadn't started this one yet. Uh, but, but I do want to talk about, you know, your, your background as a doctor in traditional medicine and being at big giant hospitals um, and then being a healthcare innovator. What you feel like a couple of those main lessons are that have helped you uh, as you guys have been ramping up so fast? So I think that's uh, uh, the answer to that is podcast number two because it's the full hour of what you know. What lessons have I learned? What could I be doing better? What mistakes am I making this time around? Because there's a whole host of new ones. Um, you know, heal um, was an incredible opportunity, and it genuinely became like a child to me, right? I, I was pregnant the entire, pregnant or feeding someone the entire time I was running Heal. And I fell in love with that company the way I love my kids. It's weird, it's an inan inanimate object, right, this company. Um, but I didn't do the best job of taking care of myself uh, when I ran Heal, right? I didn't see the dog. I wasn't doing all the things I was telling patients to do because I had no time, you know. Um, I didn't see the doctor enough. I didn't, you know, exercise enough. I didn't eat right. All these things that I could have done better for, for me, for Nick, for my family, for my parents. And there was that void that in this business, I really made an attempt to focus on taking good care of my own health, right? Sleeping enough, eating properly, exercising seeing the doctor, getting my physical. Um, that's been a really big shift in, in the way I do things. You know, I've always wanted that, of course, for my employees, but now I've got it too. So that, that's one very big shift. And I think the other thing that I do, whether it be HEAL or my private practice in nephrology or even at this company is, I never want to lose sight of the patient. So the patient is always at the center of anything I build. When you have a venture capital funded company, you're answering to investors, you're answering to board members, you're answering to people who know how to do what you do better than you know how to do in their opinion, right? It becomes very customers, it becomes very difficult to stay focused. At Heal and in this company, the thing that I have not, and, and again, as a physician who practices, the thing that I have not let go of is the importance of sticking to what the patient needs. Am I building what a patient can use, can benefit from, will have a better outcome from? You know, it's not just about the money, it's about is this actually helping? Is this actually working? Um, so that's something that didn't change. It's interesting as you talk, you know, we just had Carl Alomar on the show uh, last week for, for the second time, and um, he was over at Digital Ocean. They grew, I think, their top market cap, they got up to 15 billion, okay? And I was asking him, what are these secrets, like zero to billion type of secrets? And he emphasized some things that are not going to be shocking to other people, um, but he just went deeper than other folks. And it's actually something common amongst some of like the, the highest level entrepreneurs I've ever had on the show. Of he, he talked about this idea of product market fit, where this is like, it's so much what your customers want, you, you almost can't keep it in stock kind of thing, to a degree that's like, we've all heard about product market fit. like ad nauseum. I mean, you never, you never stop hearing about it, right? And yet, as li I'm listening to him, I'm like, ooh, I don't think I really understood it. Like, there's, so for them, like, they worked so closely on it being so easy and so desirable 
for the for the users to get started with them. They were selling them little bits of, of cloud computing service. That they actually started this measurement of like, are we keeping up with our customers' demand? And they put a sticky note on their conference wall. And every time that they weren't able to fill customer demand, they put a red sticky note on. They did it with a wall of red. It took them like months and months to start getting greens on there. And he's like, that's product market fit when you literally can't make your stuff fast enough to keep up to your customers, right? And so it's funny when you when you reached out about coming back on the show, I was like, oh yeah, Renee's great. Let's let's see what she's doing now. And then as I started getting into the like literally what you're doing, I'm like, oh my gosh, we need this. So like I've already sent it to my wife and I've already sent it to my mother-in-law and uh, like I think about myself even just like picking up prescriptions is annoying. And like then there's those prescriptions that they'll only give you the new one from a certain date even though you picked it up late, you know, and these kind of things, right? And uh, from this convenience factor and I think one of my favorite things about what you're doing is in my experience healthcare leaves a lot to be desired when it comes to what's it like to be a patient. I mean, you, you think about how much time gets wasted sitting in a doctor's office for an appointment. Like there's such low accountability for them to be where to be where they say they're going to be when they say they're going to be there. Like most of the rest of us would get fired. It's just as consumers, it's like Blockbuster. Like nobody shopped at Blockbuster once there was a Netflix, you know? Like there's so many things about the medical system that like essentially take it take the customer for granted no matter how badly we treat them we're going to keep them right and so uh, I think it's great when there's so many digital options and we've, we've had the opportunity to have some great startups and CEOs on the show who are doing things digitally but in some ways it almost feels like the pendulum goes too far the other direction and so to me like especially as I think about uh, my mom my mother-in-law people in our lives who are these aging baby boomers with that the healthcare needs are starting to stack on top of each other, let alone my kids, myself, my, my wife, right? But um, having that human aspect, and you, we'll get you to actually explain how this works, but like that it's not 100% digital. It doesn't go from 100% poor customer human service to 100% digital. Like being able to cross both those worlds to me is just like such a great emergency break backup yes. parachute. Yes, yes. And I think... So speaking to product market fit, this was something that we spent a year working on, right? We engaged NORC, we did pilots, we went through the AARP incubator and we asked patients, lots and lots of patients, what do you want, right? What do you want to see, right? And they told us, we don't, we don't want to have to make an appointment. We want someone to do it for us. We don't want to have to go to the pharmacy. We want someone to deliver medications. We don't want to have to remember to take these medications or that you can't take this with grapefruit juice. Build it, right? We want rides. We want, you know, supplies. We want to know, I'm, I'm, I have this Medicare Advantage plan. What's in network? I don't even know what I get with this plan. So we built our roadmap based on that feedback, right? And one by one, we are releasing the features that our patients and our members, they are now our members, told us they wanted, right? And to, to speak to what you're describing, this should be for everybody. This should be for you taking care of your kids and their appointments and their vaccine schedule. And this should be for you and any medication you take that you know, you're having a hard time remembering or, or to, not be able to get, right? And so we have very much thought about how this can be for everyone. We always do, even at Heal, that was for everybody. It was for kids, it was for adults, it was primary care, right? So that's very much what we think about. The, the red dot comment, I mean, we're full of red dots, right? We're just going very slowly releasing each and every one of these features. I think the most important thing about what you just said is the scale. The United States has a caregiver shortage, right? Women have left the workforce to care for their children at the same time they're caring for aunts and uncles and parents. They are trying to get back to work. There is no way, and I know because I take care of our parents, my husband and, and my parents, there is no way a human can do all of these jobs. And frankly, there is no need, right? 
When I started the journey of caregiving, it was little things. My sister asked me for advice. My brother-in-law asked me for some advice. Now it's like, you know, hey, sissy, you know, so-and-so fell in, in Atlanta. What do I do? Right? <laughs> you know, and there is no way that my brother-in-law can fly to Atlanta right now to help, right? What can he do? How can he advise his mom? How can we get a doctor's appointment, avoid the ER, make sure he has pain medications? So much of this software can do, right? So much of it. There are certain things I agree, you know, because healthcare is such a mess. Scheduling, there is no universal way to schedule an appointment. Imaging, there is no universal way to get your bloody x-ray result, you know? Um, reminders, why not automate? Falling, why not have devices, right? Um, In-network benefits, why is it so hard? Is, it, is that on purpose? I really wonder, right? To, to wonder what is covered. You know, my father has Medicare and a secondary, and the secondary covers food delivery, right? How awesome, you know, it saves my mom, who's also older, trips to the market huge for them, right? So um, I think product market fit in healthcare, it's like, gosh, we need all the products now. There's tons of red dots. And then on the other end, you get told if you do too much, you don't focus. You need to be focused. You know, in healthcare, like anything you pick up, there's a mess under. It's like the junk drawer of tech, right? Um, and then on the other end, especially because of COVID, there are so many point solutions. And I don't know, are they actually helping? You know, there's this small uh, issue in mental health or just medication reminders or just a pill box. If it's all not brought together, it's not doing anything. It's not just that you have to remember to take your medications. They have to be refilled. They have to be working. If they're not working, you need to see a doctor. If you're not seeing a doctor, then you need to know who's in network. An appointment needs to be made. And it just goes around and around. And Renee, the, the strategy behind Renee and the thought process behind Renee is what we internally call a closed loop effort to take care of people, right? We are proactively thinking about where failures happen in a person's healthcare journey, and we are creating software to try to fix them. Yeah, so when you, when you think about CEOs who are listening today, and they're, in a, they're not in healthcare, and they're listening to what you're saying, say, how do I adapt this to my industry? What are the principles behind that mindset that you think could be applied no matter who we're serving? I think there are performance principles first, right? I think, for example, and hilariously, unfortunately, healthcare doesn't apply to any industry, right? You can, you can see that even in the way the stock market is melting. Many stocks have gone down. Health tech is down by 90%, right? Which makes you wonder what in the hell has been happening in some of these companies all this time, right? Um, but I think performance metrics are a really important principle. Anybody who's a CEO of a company is looking at, are we actually delivering on the job that we said we're going to do? And what I think healthcare and folks in healthcare are too far away from, strangely, is whether or not the efforts they're making are actually working. To give you an example of what I mean by that, if you look at health insurance companies and, and their um, trust, uh, trust metric, do patients actually trust that their health insurance is doing the right for, thing for them? It's pathetically low, like 17%, you know, some have an NPS scores of negative numbers, right? Pathetic, right? So in other industries, this would be totally unacceptable, right? In other industries, that CEO would be fired if you couldn't even build a trustworthy product. Another example would be outcomes. So you have health insurance, you have a doctor, and yet you're not getting better, right? You missed a screening. You know, every year a woman needs to get a mammogram after the age of 50. And if she doesn't, it could be catastrophic for her. She could get cancer, it could have spread, she could be sick, need chemo, and unfortunately die, right? These are outcome measures that every industry has and the way our industry is set up you really only need to look at those outcome measures once a year what right medicare sets up what we call stars ratings and every um patient based on their age needs to follow guidelines to make sure certain measures are taken care of one time a year two times a year 
That's just not how healthcare works, right? Maybe you didn't have breast cancer this year, but next year you do, right? You can't drop the ball. Um, and finally, I'll say, you know, COVID was catastrophic to so many industries, right? And we're still living the supply chain issue and, and whatnot. But in healthcare, people just stopped seeing their doctor completely. They just didn't go for two, two and a half years. Their disease state spread, they have new diagnoses, they stopped taking their medications, um, they, their mental health went, you know, you have seen by the, you know, dozens of mental health startups. Mental health was a huge issue during the pandemic and slowly, maybe slowly improving. There was no preparedness. There was no preparedness. Again, I, any CEO prepares for eventualities. Hilariously, Heal was prepared. We were right on the money for a pandemic, right? And for people who don't know, for people who maybe some who didn't catch last episode, can you tell them what Heal was doing with the going to going yeah, people? Yeah, so Heal was started by Nick, my husband, and I eight years ago. Uh, it was primary care in the home for all ages. We would deliver a house call. We would go into that house call, set our patients up with remote monitoring devices and video telemedicine. And they would, after that house call, be able to engage with us using the devices we gave them to check blood sugars or blood pressures and get on video and have an appointment with us, right? So when the pandemic hit, overnight, we went to a telemedicine company, right? Overnight, you know? Um, and we did not stop uh, operating. We were doing vaccines and, you know, COVID tests. We were doing everything we could do to keep our patients safe and at home, where many companies just didn't know what to do. And then of course, many new companies have sort of ridden the COVID wave. And you know, now that the COVID wave is dying, they are also dying, right? Um, so I think you know, that, that lack of preparedness was just so bizarre, right? I think to the CEO in another industry, they had the team or the, the knowledge or the you know, predictive sense to prepare for how to deal with people not coming into offices anymore or, you know, separation and space requirements or frankly having COVID and losing your workforce. In healthcare, none of that happened. It was, I mean, you saw the way the, the vaccine was rolled out. The whole thing was uh, chaos, right? So I think for any CEO who's listening, you know, healthcare somehow, because you're desperate and you're sick and you just tolerate what exists, does not have the same metrics of success and it's gotten away with it for a very long it still gets away with it long time so i'm interested when talking to investors you know i saw some numbers on linkedin and places about some of your race are you guys disclosing how much you've raised total we've now? total we've raised 7.8 million total two seeds and um when you think about telling this story to people who aren't doctors who people who haven't spent eight years in in health tech innovation and stuff um where do you feel like the light came on for them like what, what was it about your pitch that got you almost $8 million? I so just far? got this amazing email from an old friend who said, if I'm thinking about this, right, this is going to relieve my headache because you're going to help my mom get her medications filled and remind her to take them. Right. <laughs> That's how I say it. And that email, I mean, which, you know, just came in from an old friend. That's it, right? We're going to remind and handle all the little tasks that you need your mom to do, and it's gonna give you peace of mind. So that like resonates more than you, than you would know. So my when my father-in-law passed away from cancer, we moved my mother-in-law in with us for four years. And then we moved her about five minutes away. And it, I mean, it was kind of like an extra, like maybe 20 hour a week job for my wife to help my mother-in-law. And, um, and, I think about both my mother-in-law and my wife, how many hours they spend going through plans, reading fine print, trying to figure out what's what. I mean, that alone is a major service. I mean, you look at like, I look at in the investment world. I, I have all these really wealthy entrepreneurs on the show and friends and stuff. And we're, you know, some of them have become investors in our commercial real estate fund. We've got this cash flow fund. We're buying like building Airbnb resorts, right? And when they look at all of the potential things they could put money in, how many ETFs, how many stocks, how many, uh, you know, and then you start adding in the cryptos and NFTs that are like, 
they're supposed to be so great, but nobody knows where the cash flow comes from. And, you know, they're like a black box, and, right? Well, or in reality, there is no cash flow. You're just trading on a human emotion. But we won't go into that diatribe. But, like, it is so overwhelming for very intelligent people, very wealthy, intelligent people who, like, they spent 20 years, 30 years learning how to make money, and now how to manage it passively is like, oh, geez, that is just so much. That's the way, I, like, if I didn't have my wife to read every medical thing ever, like, I don't know how much I would do because I'd be like, oh, I'm just going to mail it in. Like, that sounds like a lot of work to figure yep. it out. You wouldn't do it. And, and I'm not that, I'm not that sick. Yeah, but God forbid, and this is what every one of us has in common, we're all going to be patients, right? And this is also why moms and women are often the chief medical officer of the house, right? Um, the products that I build are for the chief medical officers of the house, right? That, that is who I focus on, the me. Um, I'm doing all these jobs. My husband, you know, without a discussion, just canceled his primary care appointment, which I waited two months to make, right? I, it took me two months to get that appointment. And he has just gone and canceled it. And um, he says to me, well, I wasn't going to cancel it for him, right? So he says to me, give me the number. I'm going to do it. And I'm like, no. You know, because I just know he won't and he'll go to the doctor's office, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's it's unnecessarily difficult. There is no transparency. And there's a lot of very cool startups that are working on that problem. The, the move towards interoperability where you can actually see your records. Renee is born out of that opportunity, right? Even a year ago, you you had to go through a nightmare to get your records. Now, coming coming very shortly, your records will be yours, and they have to be given to you in a format you can read, which is huge, right? Um, and additionally, you will see software telling you, this is how much it costs to get your surgery at this hospital versus that hospital, right? Because why is that not known? When you go to buy something, a gallon of milk, it's $7 six dollars right why don't you know how much a surgery should cost granted you can't predict every detail but you should have some idea why don't you know if your insurance is going to cover the experience right i mean i'm still dealing with i have fantastic health insurance that doesn't pay for God, anything i don't know what it does right so it is unnecessarily hard it is uh, frankly done on purpose because what are you going to do about it, you know? And like I said, a lot of these insurance companies have gotten away with it, you know, and I, I, I say it all the time, right? It's, it's done by design. Why are there so many plans? What does this one have that this one doesn't, you know, why did this one, why did my friend pick that one? And then my employer gave me that one, right? Who knows, you know? So I, I think a lot of these things are done by design and Look, I think, you know, having been involved with so many health insurances and worked with them to do the work I did at Heal, you know, even the people that work there don't know the answer to these questions. And half the half of them don't even use the same insurance for the company they work, right? They go and they get a competitor's insurance. I mean, which is what? You know? So so I think in in the end, especially with how much money has poured into health tech, either these companies, these systems and, and payers are going to innovate and improve and share data and share records and do better to have transparency, or they're going to be eliminated. And we saw this last year, for example, you know, Humana churned so many of its members that they decreased their guidance, right? And what happened is all these patients are like, why don't I sign up with this insurance? They're doing this for me and that for me. And everything is obvious on the website and they're sharing my records and they told me who my doctor is and they gave me a black card so I can go to the gym. You know, why would I stick with Humana, right? This is not gonna be the first time we hear this, right? This is going to happen again and again. And um, you see how much uh, MA um, uh, movement there is in the space, how many new MA plans there are. And very interestingly, Medicare is trying to innovate, right? They've had an innovation center for a long time. I participated in a lot of their innovation programs back at Heal and did very well. Now they're 
making it very interesting to keep your Medicare. Why get an MA plan at all, yeah. right? We should do another episode. We should invite either like the head of Medicare or the head of like innovation at Medicare and you should come co-host with me and we'll, we'll interview them together on the show. So um, this is, I don't think I ever shared this with you. So I was pregnant year six of Running Heel or year, no, year four of Running Heel. And we wanted to be able to use house call codes for Medicare recipients. So we launched in DC and Maryland and Virginia and I don't know how many times I flew out to CMS. So many times I got put on bed rest, okay? And what we did was we convinced them, we were part of a group, but we convinced them to allow everybody to be able to use house call codes. Before we did that, house call codes could only have been used if you were a bed bound Medicare recipient. And thanks to the work we did, anybody can use house call codes, right? Two years old, 92 years old. They are very innovative, right? During the Trump administration, so much effort was put, you know, to their credit in making transparency happen, lowering the price of drugs. The, the Medicare Advantage programs increased, but so much effort was put on getting, you know, out of the way of the doctor patient relationship, right? Those are words from their mouths. They said that to me that we want you to support the patients, we don't want to get in the way of that relationship. And I thought, wow, that's beautiful, right? And I think it will continue. I, I, you know, I think the Biden administration will continue in this, right? But Medicare is, is paying attention. And if you're paying attention to what Medicare Advantage is, you're asking some questions about, why do I need this? Medicare is pretty damn good, you know? Uh, there's, there's a couple of things you talked about that uh, I'd love to maybe dive a little deeper in. I think about when I'm hearing this, like part of the reason I'm like really optimistic for you guys is the, how deep you understand the issues because, you know, again, helping your, helping your father with all these things and like, you know, he's saying, Hey Renee all the time. Right. And you've got like, you've got such insight into the frustration of like, I already have a life. I have kids. I didn't know my, you know, I didn't realize this, my parents were going to need this much. Like, like that frustration is so real for you. And um, it's just so obvious where the struggle and the pain points are. And then, you know, as a doctor, as a previous healthcare technologist, innovator, whatever title you want to put there, like you're coming at it from with with such rich perspective from from multiple sides there. Um, no, no wonder you've attracted so many investors. Um, my thought, though, that I'm thinking about that I'd love to talk about is this idea of struggle and this idea of the worst things are the biggest, the bigger the entrepreneur opportunity. You know, like I, so like a couple of months ago, I don't think I've told you this. A couple of months ago, we started offering a service. So we have other CEOs that are like, Jess, you, you know, you know, all these billionaires and pro athletes and movie stars and public company CEOs and all these like ideal prospects and whatever. Like I want a show like that. So now we have this service where the team that builds my show can build a show for some other CEO. Right. And building a podcast sucks. Do you know how hard it is? Do you know how hard it is to track down, like if you want really good guests, to get their assistant to work with your assistant on a time and they reschedule and they whatever. <laughs> and uh, like just that is like, oh my gosh, I already have a day job, right? And then all the technical issues of like, you know, the, the dog was barking or the this and like the, something happened with the sound and did that upload right and tracking it and then, and then all the posting about it, but like it's, like, no wonder we have this whole team here to do all these different steps. And then you got the social media post, whatever, right? And so, like, we, got, we just got a new client. Uh, it's it's CEO.com, okay? They run the third largest tech conference in the world. It's the guy who started Silicon Slopes, like 20, 25,000 people a year, right? He said, like, Mark Zuckerberg and Tim Cook and, like, founders of all these billion-dollar firms. And... <laughs> He doesn't need me. He's already producing episodes. But, but uh, Clint, he's, good. he's a friend. He's a super smart guy. But he's like, oh, yeah, I don't want to do any of that. I just want to do the fun part and talk to the cool people. <laughs> can you, Jess, can you get me cool people? And can you, can, you do all this, can you do all the annoying stuff, right? And it's like, there's really good money in taking on the part that sucks. You know? And I, I look at you guys where you're going after, like, I was, so... I was under a big deadline. 
but I needed to go get a prescription because I know that they're not going to give me the next one if I picked up this one late until whatever, right? And this is like really fresh for me because it's like day before yesterday. I run over there on my lunch. They don't have it ready. Oh, we can have it for you in 10 minutes. So I go sit on the chair and like, like 40 minutes later, I'm like, hey guys, what, what happened? And they're like, oh, it's ready. I was like, well, I'm the only guy sitting here this whole time. You didn't like, what, what, what's going on? And it's like, like I had real work to do and I was planning on like a pop in and grab it. Like I, I kind of didn't have time for that. Like that was an hour round trip, the, an unnecessary hour round trip. And it was like extra poignant because I just didn't have that hour to give away that day, right? Not, not that I want to waste an hour normally, but it's even worse when you're like under the gun. I, like I was in the office till midnight as a result, you know, not just because of that. But do you know what I mean? Like, uh, so taking on the part that sucks and again, with your level of sophistication and background and medical credentials and business credentials, um, it, it seems pretty ideal. I'm interested, though, the investors you did uh, end up working with, were there certain reasons you picked the ones you did or, or wh what happened yeah. in that thought so, process? Yeah, so regarding the struggle, right, I, I love the parts that suck because I think nobody wants to do them. And I'm, you know, there's so much greed in health tech, by the way, that nothing does get done because everybody just wants to make a quick buck. That's just not right. What did what did Donald Trump said? Who knew it would be this hard? You know, it is it is all a struggle. So it's easy to pick up a struggle. And if you're not a greedy person, you can actually make a very big difference. It takes time, but you can make a very big difference. So I like those projects. Right. I like seeing that I'm making a difference in terms of the this idea that um, something you said to me that I wanted to respond to the the picking a, a, a venture capitalist right so you know we've had the privilege of dealing with so many investors at heel and then again you know at this company and one of the things we focused on in this company was only institutional uh, capital right so we did not have uh, any angels in in this company and in the last company we did Every one of our investors, uh, I can tell you, is just such, um, you know, none of them are health tech, uh, you know, gurus by, by any means, but they are so supportive of what we want to do because they know it is such a difficult problem that they accept that they may not have the answer, right? They never, I have never heard, and we talk to our investors regularly, we are giving them updates constantly. I've never had one of them call me and say, you know, Renee, that was really a silly way to do it. You should have done it this way. It's Renee, you're the doctor. What do you think? You know, um, and I, I value that independence and freedom so much because as I was saying, you know, in the beginning of our conversation, if I'm constantly changing my product to fit what somebody else is saying, I'm never going to achieve the market fit that I think solves the struggle, right? Everyone I tell, just like Dr. House calls, personal health assistant makes sense to everybody. There's nobody that doesn't understand what I'm describing. They could be rich, they could be poor, they could be, you know, black, they could be white, whatever. We all are patients. In the end, we're all patients. It doesn't matter what you have in healthcare. And that struggle, your hour to you is so valuable. It is to someone just like you, right? Who maybe doesn't do what you do. There is no, there is no one that won't understand it. Do it. Does every VC want to invest in it? No, they may not make their money back fast enough. Right. And that is a very important thing for when you're dealing with institutional capital. So I'm not saying that everybody thinks this is a great idea or wants to invest in it, but I am saying that the, the group that we have put together have been, I mean, I cannot say enough about how supportive they have been. They just, mind their business about what we're doing and hope for our success. And that is a privilege. That's a privilege.
Yeah. So I've done a ton of hiring, a ton of it. I did a ton of it at Heal, and I, you know, have responsibilities for every person we bring on. And I will tell you that I, I don't know that I'm the best at hiring. Maybe that's because of this quality, which I think is something about me that is, you know, good, bad, I don't know. I just, I just have to tell the truth. I just am not a bullshitter. I do not know how to do it. I do not have a bullshitting face. I don't have any of the qualities of a person who is full of crap. I, I never have, I probably never will, I'm too old, you know? So when I get on uh, the phone or, or have a, you know, video com conversation with someone that I think would be wonderful talent for our team, they almost might come back and say, wow, she really tried to scare me away, you know? Working with startup, right? You know, it's all hands on deck. You might be a doctor, but you're doing product. You might be an engineer, but I'm going to make you a customer and see if you'd actually use this. If you're not going to use it, why would anybody else, right? Um, and so that, that business of being very, very honest, I think has served me well, right? Because people who are not interested in hard work, too chicken, um, not, not interested in solving a difficult problem, this isn't the right place for them, right? We're, we know damn well we're not going to see that we've solved America's healthcare problems this year, right? It's going to take us a while. If you're not in it to solve America's healthcare problems, this isn't the right company for you because there are plenty of companies that are very well funded solving this little bit of a humongous problem that's probably a great a great place to go for the, for those kinds of folks so i think that that would be the the most important thing that i offer in terms of recruiting and hiring and working with the right people i still haven't gotten it completely down by the way well nobody gets it completely down you know we we've had a number of folks from the intelligence agencies and from the special operations community and some from like the most elite levels you know the the JSOC, so SEAL Team 6, Delta Force for the Army, right? And, you know, the news talks a lot about, oh, it's so hard to be a Navy SEAL, and it is. It's really hard. You know, the guys in Coronado were clients of mine for years, and 80% and of the people don't make it, right? Uh, but like Delta, it's 95%. So 20% make it into SEALs, 5% make it into SEALs. So arguably four times harder, right? And they still get it wrong. but. I mean, they, like, I, I feel like corporate America uh, does not take enough learning from those guys, and, uh, but it sounds like you would get along with them really well, because they are so serious about selection. And for them, there's a saying, selection is an ongoing process. Just because you made it in does not mean you will, you will remain here. Like, a lot of military units, you do, but that one, you don't. Like, other units, like, you got to do something pretty bad to get pushed out. Here it's like, the second you're not giving 100%, you're out. Because we're, we're going like, no fail missions, let's find a nuclear bomb so it doesn't blow up a city stuff, right? And, uh, and, and then they train like crazy. And they take like, instead of like your typical military where it's like, the one person at the top has the brain and everybody else is just there to, to execute what they think. Like those guys is like the opposite. It's like, they train everybody so well so that the frontline guy, they can actually trust to make decisions. But they select, they're just so brutal about you, like you can't be a quitter. Like the worst, we just did a fundraiser for our charity Child Rescue on Saturday. We had a 28 year Green Beret who spent half that time in a classified unit. And he says, you wanna know the number one thing we look for out of any of that? Someone who won't quit. You, you know, you'd be a good runner, you don't have to be a great runner. You'd be good at this, you don't have to be great. Good at this, you don't have to be great. You just can't be a quitter because when everything is at its worst, I got to know you're not going to give up on me. And it sounds like, it sounds like you kind of, maybe yeah. you wouldn't articulate I it mean, that way, but it sounds like you got some things. Th to those folks save our lives, right? They, they, you know, the, the service, there's no comparison, right? American healthcare be damned, right? Thank goodness for, for the, the folks who put their literal lives on the line for us. So I have enormous respect and gratitude and not quitting means something very different almost. But I will tell you the medical system is the, the training system is based on a hierarchical 
um, uh, teaching, you know, gaining responsibility uh, structure just as the military is. And um, when you're a senior resident, you know, we have this saying, see one, do one. We teach our interns what to do, right? They see it once, they have to do it once, right? I'll never forget the first time I put in a catheter for someone to have dialysis, right? I saw it once and then I was in someone's neck making a hole for a, you know, catheter, right? That big. It, it, and then I became a fellow. No pressure. Yeah, I mean, it, it no was pressure. unbelievable, right? It was an unbelievable, I will never forget that day. And uh, uh, I was the only girl in my program. I, you know, I went to this program where I was like, I think maybe the first girl or the second girl. And um, they all thought I was a princess. So they were like, oh, she won't even be able to do it. And I crushed it, thank goodness. But I was shaking, sweating, all of it, right? Um, and you grow and you learn and you learn. In, in a startup, there is, again, this, if you quit, the company quits. There's seven of you, five of you, whatever. It's a tiny little thing. And your presence, if not there, it's felt. So part of what you're screening for is the guts to stick around. And I think, especially during COVID and this work from home remote environment, that also changed a lot about people. I am very good at working at home because I'm very good at multitasking. I got to deal with my kids or my parents might call or I might run and come back or I'm cool with working at night or on the weekends. A lot of folks, especially in corporate America, the, the deal is you work from Monday to Friday, nine to five. And after that, it's you, you don't bother, right? You don't you shouldn't be bothered, I should say. That just does not work in a startup. You know, there is no way if you're software, I mean, at heel, I would wake up at five and go to bed at nine because I needed to be up with New York and asleep with Los Angeles, right? And I did it every day. And I would repeatedly on Saturday morning see the software break. And I was the only one up, you know? I mean, I, it's a true story, right? So, and it wasn't once, it, it was like a joke. Like what if Renee doesn't wake up, you know? So, <laughs> right? So, I mean, I think, I think the, <clears throat> Again, the, the responsibility pales to the military, but there is this philosophical stance that you have to be gritty and you have to be willing to put some of your personal life on the shelf or at the very least expand your hours to nights and weekends and maybe miss, miss a couple things too. I started HEAL so that doctor moms could make it to their kids' school events. I never made it to any. Right. I never made it to any for eight years. I missed them all. You know, this year I'm, you know, this company, I'm trying to make it to some of those. Right. But still, that means I'm working till nine o'clock that night for sure. I want to dive into this more because um, I've talked about this a bit on the show. The more I meet superstars in the business world on the show, the more I realize my thinking is wrong. You know, I. After investment banking, when I got into, when I started my first private equity fund, I was like 28 year old CEO raising tens of millions of dollars, thinking I knew what I was doing mostly kind of, you know, but it was in a very asset direct world. Like we, we were bringing this, um, we invest in this firm that's bringing a small hydro technology over from France, right? And you could put it into an existing dam and we had a $180 million guaranteed investment contract from, from the provincial government out in West, Eastern Canada if we could get the dang things right. installed. Okay? But like at that point, once those were installed, the power purchase agreement, I mean, it's a 20-year right. contract, right? right? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't highly dependent on does, is the customer still going to want electricity right. tomorrow? Like that's kind of a given. Like we, you know, guarantee is a swear word yeah. in investing, in my opinion, <laughs> unless it's the government right. guaranteeing you, right? And so had we been able to get all of those installed, we actually could have used the, the swear word, right? Um, not a super people dependent business for the next 20 years once it's installed, right? Like that asset, you know, you gotta have some maintenance guys and this and that, but, but um, I don't know. I realized that like tainted so much of my worldview on business in general about like, well, what's the thing? Oh yeah, we gotta get, we gotta get people who can do good enough but the thing is the thing, you know, the app, the, the whatever it is, right? And the more I hang out with superstars on the show, like those really like just elite performers, you talk about performance with, with the results that are just absurdly uncommon. They're more like Billy Bean. You know that uh, Brad Pitt movie? 
um, uh, Moneyball, right? Um, good movie, great book, by the way. But like, it's it's not about the bat. It's not about the cleats. It's not about the baseball uniform, right? Like, it is so the individual. And like, back to special ops. I, you know, like those guys, you drop them out of a plane, and all of a sudden they lose all their gear. Like all they've got is a big pen. They're still going to go accomplish their mission. You know what I mean? Because it's it's the operator. And so, as I'm hearing you talk, I. I shouldn't have been surprised, but I didn't expect that answer to be selection. So I want to go back to it because as soon as you say it, it's obvious, but it wasn't where my head went first. So this is my really long intro to my question. For you, how do you sort the difference between people who interview well, like they interview like they're going to be gritty versus the ones that actually are? And how do you get yourself to to make the change when you realize they weren't? Because most of us hire fast and fire slowly, even though we're supposed to do the opposite. So um, I have to say that I have, um, I have one quality that I think is a little special about me. Uh, I think my read on character is A+, plus, right? If I'm having a conversation with someone, somehow I can just read the kind of person they're going to be, right? And I want to be clear, if I'm the fourth one talking to that person, let's suppose we're talking about hiring someone. If I'm the fourth one and they're coming to me heavily recommended, it affects my judge of character. I can't do it as well because I've been biased, right? I'm meeting this person for a fourth interview. My team loves them. They've got to be great, right? I love my team, I, you know, so on. Yeah. And that has made many a mistake. That has made many a mistake. So if I reverse that and I'm the first person, if I ask for the job where I can do the screening, I can get the person on the phone, have a 15, 20 minute conversation and see if I want to go further. That's where that character about me really shines, where I can have a conversation with someone and get a read on them and say, this person would be a fit. On this, and what are you listening for? You. What, what helps yeah, your spidey sense you. go off? Um, they've researched the company, they've researched me, they understand the mission, they have ideas for the mission, they're willing to give up something, working at a very well-funded startup, salary, you know, time, whatever it is, right? I want to do this with you. I believe in what you're doing. You could be the person to change this problem. And, you know, for what it's worth, having done, again, tons of screening and tons of interviews, I have had the incredible um, responsibility and opportunity to have people say something like that to me. I've read about you. I've heard of you. I know what you're doing, and I want to be a part of it, hook or crook, you know. Um, and when you get to hear something like that, it really impresses upon you that this is a person who's committed, right? As I get through an interview process with them, I might see how they react to something, you know? One time at Heal, we drove to see patients in their homes. And one time I was on the phone with a doctor in the car. I had, I had to go somewhere and all I could do was, you know, dial in to our, our call. And um, a car accident happened right in front of me. You know, a big rig hit a car. And I said, oh my goodness, you know, a, oh my goodness, I just saw a car, you know, get hit. Oh my goodness, you know, just give me a second, make sure everything's okay. And um, you would think that a person interviewing for a job would hear that I got into a car accident and think, holy crap, I don't want to work for a company that's going to make me drive. What if I get into a car accident? This particular doctor was like, I can't believe how cool it is that you would pause and make sure you don't need to help. You know, this is awesome. Right? Like, you talk the talk. That person was hired, right? Um, I think people show you who they are, right? What's that great quote? When people show you who they are, believe them, right? Maya Angelou. And I believe them, you know? I believe them. And when they show me that they're screwing around and wasting my time, you know, scheduling something, forgetting, not showing, giving me some blase answer, not knowing what they're talking about, 
I believe them too, right? And I don't move forward with hiring them. Um, I left Heal and so many of the people I hired are still there, right? Which I think is a real testament to, you know, good hiring. On the other hand, I cannot count how many mistakes I've made. Um, with judging someone's character, thinking they're going to make it, and then the market melts down, right? Uh, times get tough. Is a personal health assistant really what we should be focusing on when, you know, right now inflation and it costs so much to buy milk and, and so on, right? These are, the, these are the times when you look at your team and, you know, we've had a wonderful team, thank goodness, but you look at your team and you wonder, I, I hope they're not pooping out, right? I hope they're not getting scared, you know? Fundraising, good grief, fundraising is hard, you know? I hope people aren't getting discouraged. It's really hard to raise funds right now. Um, so I think some of those things you have to have the predictive quality to ask about, but you may not even, I didn't know we were going to be this knee deep in an inflation. I really didn't. I should have, but I didn't, you know, at least I didn't think it was going to be this bad. I didn't predict Russia and you, the Ukraine, right? Um, you know, seeing these things happen, maybe I could have screened a little tighter and I just didn't, you know? So I think, again, when people show me who they are, I believe them, you know, and I act quickly, right? Hire, don't hire. I love everything you said, but I think my favorite thing is like, as you were talking, and I can't remember what you said, but it reminded me of like, who Elon Musk is hiring at yeah. SpaceX. Like, if you, if you are not in your soul trying to figure out how to get life on Mars, he really didn't want you. You shouldn't work for him. Like, like all these rockets and helping NASA and all this stuff is so that we can afford to get people at Mars, that's get right. people to Mars. And like, if that's not kind of what, like your internal engine, how do we get yeah. people on Mars? Like this is not the place for you. And, and like thinking that through of the like, <clears throat> it just gives me another lens to look at our, so we, we literally doubled our staff in the last eight weeks. And we, we need to grow by like another 50% over the next six weeks, probably. Right. Maybe, maybe another eight weeks. And, um, so this is very live for me right now. Right. And, uh, and like, it does give me this extra gauge of like, yeah, what, like, do I really think I know what they're passionate about? And is it this, or is this a job? Like, is this a job and they happen to be good? at doing a job or like, is this what they're all about? Yeah. I mean, you see that on you know? every job description, mission driven company, right? If your employees in a tiny little startup or even in a company that's, you know, in a huge growth phase like yours are not willing to put in the extra effort. And that may mean time. That may mean money. That may mean both. Right. I just don't think it's the right place for them. Right. And I think, you know, the Elon Musk, uh, comment is, is right on. I mean, his, his businesses focus on world universe changing ideas, right? Agree with him or no, agree with his, the way he does things or no. If you can't work with him, then you shouldn't, you know, if you don't like the way he does things, you shouldn't work for him. Right? Because I mean, credit to him and I'm not a big fan of all the, you know, things that he does but I understand who he is because he says who he is. And I believe it, <laughs> you know, I believe it. I'm listening and I'm paying attention. And sure. if you aren't paying attention, if you're not doing the research and reading the tweets, what, what are you doing? Right. He, you know, you're not going to know mm. him. So I think that's why that, that part about the research is so important too. I was, I mentor a college student and she's um, going to go into medicine, but first she wants to have a job for a little bit. And I've, I've been helping her and she said, should I write a cover letter? You know, and there's all this discussion, is it a waste or whatever? You know, I, I have seen cover letters that say, I watched X, Y, and Z panel and speaking engagement that, you know, Nick was on or someone from the team was on. And I thought it was so, odd. thank you for taking the 30 minutes out of your life to do that. Let me interview you and see if, we're a fit, you know, I, I used to tell, you know, people who, who worked for me, it's like, we're getting married. It's not the most HR appropriate thing, but it's like, we're getting married. This is date number one, right? If we don't go on a second date, we're not getting married, 
you know and i think it it very much is like that where you're you're in a relationship with someone that has to believe in you um and if they don't there are so many other interesting opportunities right give us the website Tell us where you're at today. If people want to sign up for it or learn more about it, best places to go, how to connect with sure, you on social, sure. those things. So the website's renee.com, R-E-N-E-E.com. You can sign up right there. And um, you can actually enter Renee50, R-E-N-E-E-50, -E and that will give you 50% off for a month or something. I think the first month is free, and then you'll get 50% off for another month. Um, and it's uh, $24.99. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. My email is... R-E-N-E-E -E -E at Renee.com, right? So very simple. Um, and uh, we just launched last week, which is why I was so excited to talk to you. Um, and uh, in the next, every two to four weeks, we're going to be doing new releases on things that seniors want or caregivers want. Um, the caregiver will have their own experience as well. We're building that out. So uh, I think it'll be very exciting to see uh, what we get to do. So what geographies, so here, October 2022? All over the U.S. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. We, we, can, we can work with any insurance. Frankly, anybody over 18. I don't recommend for kids yet, but we'll get there, right? Anybody over 18. Okay, well, final question here. We covered a lot of different things. Uh, what didn't I ask that I should have? Or what's something that's a soapbox issue you want to end with? What I, what I think is interesting is some people don't even understand what a personal health assistant is, right? And what I would say to that is if you don't feel well or if someone you know doesn't feel well, I bet you they need a personal health assistant, right? They need someone picking up the little tasks and little things that are happening in the background that you don't even maybe even understand or know are happening. Someone needs to do those little, get those little objectives done for you. And I think it will help tremendously, right? So not so much soapbox, but maybe you're wondering, do you need a personal health assistant? And I would say you can't imagine that you, it's like your cell phone. What were you doing before, right? What were you doing before your cell phone, <laughs> you know? So I think, I think that much of this, this concept. Okay, well, congrats Appreciate on the funding. You. Congrats on the success. Congrats Thank on the so launch. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the opportunity again. Okay, bye everyone.